Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome again. We're getting a good start tonight, uh, on time almost. So let's uh, open with a word of prayer and we'll dive right into Revelation uh, 13. Father, as uh, we uh, just quiet ourselves now from all of the stresses and the activity of the day, all of the distractions, all of the things that uh, interfere with just uh, a clear sense of your presence. Forgive us for when we uh, put a too high of a priority on some of those things. And then they cause us to take control of those things and thus deny your lordship. Forgive us for that. And tonight, as we come cleansed before you and your throne, that you will teach us from your word that we will comprehend, we will understand, we will apply to our lives, and we will rejoice in the truth. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, Revelation 13, starting in verse 11. Unless anybody has any questions from the first half of chapter 13 that we did last week. Hearing none, onward. Another beast is coming. Um, Tim LaHaye says that this is the completion of the satanic trinity. The dragon is representing God the Father, Satan himself, the dragon who tries to imitate, wants to become God the Father. The first beast, the political power, the kingdom, represents Jesus Christ, the false Jesus Christ. And now we have the, the, third, the second beast, the third member of this unholy trinity, which is going to be the false church. And the influence that the false church has on the kingdom, representing the influence of the Holy Spirit on the kingdom of God. And it is Satan's attempt to create this false Godhead that is a counterfeit of the real Godhead. Hence the number that we will discover at the end of the chapter, the number 666. First six representing Satan, the God the Father, one short of perfection, number seven. Second number representing six, uh, representing the kingdom, one short of perfection, Jesus Christ. The third number representing the false Holy Spirit, the false prophet, one number short of the Holy Spirit, number seven, six, six, six. That's my interpretation of what 666 means. It's the combination of this unholy trinity that exists on the earth during the tribulation. And so that's why that number is significant. And so when you buy into any one of those aspects of that trinity, you are essentially taking the mark of that beast into your life. If you buy into having depend on any of, to depend upon any of that for your life and your hope, then you have bought into the number of the beast. Now, let's see what this beast is like as he comes up. John sees another beast, verse 11, rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. What are lamb's horns like? They're very small, just a little nubby, aren't they, if, they're a, if it's a lamb? I mean, as the lamb grows, the horns are going to get a little bit bigger, but, but they never get really big, do they, unless it's a ram living on the side of a mountain somewhere. Uh, but uh, a typical lamb, the horns are just a little, little nubs, but it does have horns, but it represents a different kind of horn, a horn of gentleness. So we're getting a symbol of what this beast represents. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. In other words, it's a false gentleness. It's a false security. It's a false humility. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. So in other words, it comes alongside the first beast, this political kingdom, 
comes alongside of it, unites with it, becomes one with it, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So again, we're referring to the same beast of earlier in the chapter, this revived empire, Roman Empire possibly, most likely in my understanding, the revived Roman Empire that is the political kingdom of the world in the tribulation. And now there's going to be an alliance that is formed between this kingdom, this political kingdom, and the church, the false church of the tribulation. The false prophet, this beast, is going to come alongside this political power and it's going to convince the world that its hope is in this political power. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us to convince us that our hope is in Jesus Christ. The false prophet will convince the world that their hope is in the Antichrist. And Satan thus trying to, you know, Satan's never had an original thought in his life, in his existence. Everything he does is just, oh, I saw him do that, I could do it better. Right? And that's been his whole existence. It's nothing new, nothing that is original. And so here comes this false beast, uh, this false prophet rather. And in order to convince the world that he is worthy to be followed and worthy to be listened to, he performs great signs, miracles. Now we have to understand that Scripture tells us clearly in evidentiary form from Moses on and that there were false prophets, false teachers. There are people who do uh, all kinds of miraculous things, but they're not the power of Christ. They're the power of Satan. This takes great discernment in our day and age because I think that Satan, and for all of you watching out there on YouTube, uh, you need to be careful because there are preachers, there are people, there are movements, religious movements in our day, there are major worldwide known denominations who their claim to fame basically of that, that their real is the miraculous that exists around them. We have to be incredible discerners of those miracles and those signs because just because it's miraculous does not mean it's of God. Remember that. Just because it's miraculous does not mean that it's of God because Satan is able to do the miraculous. Look at the initial plagues that, that uh, when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, I am the servant of God, I carry his staff, and I will demonstrate to you that I have his power. And he did a miracle. And what did all of the, the soothsayers and the magicians around, uh, around Pharaoh do? They copied. they copied it, they did the same thing, okay? Where they couldn't copy was in the creation of life. Anything that involved the creation of life, creation of all the locusts, they couldn't do that because they can't create life. Only God can create life. But they could duplicate the other signs. Okay, They could make the staff look like a snake, even though it didn't become an actual snake. It looked like a snake. And Moses' real snake ate their snake. Okay, they couldn't, they, there, were, there were limitations on what they could do. And so, but we have to understand that, that um, the sign gifts, especially in the, in the church today, whether it be a, a, a miracle of healing somebody's sickness, whether it be a miracle of speaking in tongues, whether it be a miracle of uh, interpreting tongues or claiming some word of knowledge from the God, uh, from God or proclaiming a prophecy over somebody's life and declaring that that was done under the influence of the Holy Spirit and by the power of God, just because they did it or just because they say God did it doesn't mean God did it. We have to take everything that is done and we have to balance it in light of what all the rest of Scripture says. And all the rest of Scripture will give us an idea, the revelation of God, as to whether or not that is truly of God or not. 
And one of the primary distinguishing characteristics that you can look for when you have a discerning heart of whether something is of God or not is, does it glorify God or man? Does it glorify God or man? That's one of the first discerning th questions to ask. Who's getting attention for doing this? God or man? And if it's man, then it's of the beast, the dragon. And so we have to be very discerning. Here we see that this false prophet, this beast, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. Duplicating what uh, Elijah did on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And getting the people to believe that he speaks the truth. Verse 14 says, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. Notice, this false prophet is allowed to work these signs in the presence of of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. In other words, the political kingdom of the world has accepted this false prophet and declared this false prophet to be true because they're allowing him to continue to do all of this work. So here's what this tells you. Under a false system of political power and spiritual life, under the false system, the political power enables the church. Under God's reign, the church enables political power. God enables political power in the eternal scheme. In man's scheme, political power enables God or defines him or allows him or permits him. In our country, we started this way with God enabling political power and getting all the credit for it. No longer exists that way, does it? It's totally flipped. And we see it around the world. And here it's indicated just by those simple words that that beast is allowed to do these signs in the presence of the political power. In other words, the political power is the final authority, not God. And that's upside down. And you have to look at that within the context of all of the spiritual, religious options that there are out there in the world today. What does that religious system declare? Who do they declare to have the final authority? One of the largest denominations in all the world that has been around since the third century after Christ. Regardless of what they say of going back earlier than that, they started in the third century. One of the largest denominations of political, political religious power in the world today declares that the tradition of man is of equal authority with God. God no longer is the absolute authority. Man's tradition is of equal authority. Man's interpretation of the past and the church has taken over. The political realm of the church has taken over the authority over God. It's turning upside down even within the church as we see it happening in our world around us. So here's, um, here's this beast deceiving those who dwell on the earth. Deceiving. Scriptures tell us that in the last days God is going to cut them short so that the elect, if it were possible, will not be deceived. The deception is so powerful. I don't know how many of you follow Facebook and uh, saw the post I put on a couple of hours ago that my cousin posted first out in North Dakota and I found it and he posted it uh, and it, it's just powerful. It's David Wilkerson's uh, message recently to the uh, Assembly of God denomination to challenge them in this very thing about the deception of humanistic philosophy that has entered the church so that the church now has become nothing more than a let's tease the seekers. Let's get them to feel good about being here. Let's develop a church so that people who are in their sin aren't offended by their sin anymore and they like to come here because after all it's about increasing the numbers of the church, right? Isn't that why we exist? 
No. It's about being faithful and true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That people are dying in their sin and they are going to hell. Did you know that of the, of the uh, uh, 19 times, I think it is, in the New Testament that hell, the fires of hell, are spoken about specifically, 19 times in the New Testament, that out of those times, 65% uh, of them are spoken by Jesus himself. And yet in most of these religions of our day that are being very cautious in how they present the gospel so they don't offend anybody, all they want to do is declare, well, we're just simply following the teachings of Jesus to be loving to the world around us. Yes, Jesus was loving to the world around him, but he also spoke about the fires of hell and the judgment of sin, and then he died because it was real. And if you don't follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and repent of your sins, you will suffer an eternal condemnation in the fires of hell. And the 14th chapter of Revelation is going to tell us all about it. So here's, here's the beast who is deceiving those who dwell on the earth. And the greatest deception that is perpetrated against the human race by Satan is that you'll be okay. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. You don't really have to change. God's a God of love. You'll be okay. And the church today has to declare what the Bible declares and what God declares since Adam and Eve fell into sin. Man is not okay. He is progressing toward a permanent persecution in hell. I almost said perdition because it matched the peace, but I didn't, I spared you. Yeah, and so what, what is it that everybody says, I think that he will measure my good, decide my bad, and I think I've done more good than bad. Right. Nowhere in the Bible does that say that. No, and it, that totally denies who God is. Right. You, do you, you understand the problem with that, okay? God's, God's minimum entrance requirement into his presence is perfection. That's his minimum, minimum entrance requirement, is perfection. Anybody in here met the minimum yet? And if you haven't met the minimum, how do you do extra credit to earn more to cover up for what you've already done wrong? If the minimum, minimum requirement is perfection, and you've already blown that, where does the extra credit come from to raise the standard over here? It's, it's just total, totally illogical. And yet, people are being deceived by the false prophet, mice, <laughs> people are being deceived by the false prophet because they, they have, um, they, they want to feel good about who they are. And so this beast is deceiving those who dwell on the earth and it tells them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. To make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Now, we're not told what this image will look like. But here we have Satan saying, let's make an image that everybody can look to that represents their allegiance to the government of the world at that time. So they create an image and the false prophet was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So here we have the false prophet figuring out a way under the influence of Satan to make this image look alive. Now we don't know how that happens. We can try to explain it that uh, they build a robot. I am alive, you die, and lightning flies out of the robot's arms and kills people who don't bow down to the image, you know. That, that would be man's interpretation of a man, but there, there would be a human way for that to happen. They could build this image that is 
computer generated and uh, maybe has a, the latest form of artificial intelligence and, and they make this beast seem alive. It's more likely that it's just an image and in the deception of Satan, uh, the false beast makes it look like he's breathing or makes it look like he's talking or they just simply mount a bullhorn in its mouth and they speak through a remote control microphone from a mile away. I don't know what they do. But the point is that the people of the world are so hungry to follow a God that will finally stop convicting them of sin and will instead praise them for their sin and for their self uh, approval and for their self-sufficiency that that they will follow any they'll follow that camera if that tripod would start to move a little bit the statue of someone in a foreign country that looks like it had a little tear on it because there was a raindrop left from last night's storm and everybody says the statue is crying let's go follow that statue they will follow anything because the key is that the false prophet has already deceived them. Once deceived, you'll believe anything that matches your deception. Because once deceived, deceived means that you've chosen to believe something that isn't true. And there's not a human being alive, apart from the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that will ever admit that they're wrong. When they have chosen that belief as their hope. Apart from the conviction of the Holy Spirit, there's not a human being alive that will admit that they're wrong about a belief that they've chosen. So if they are already deceived, that means they have chosen a belief system in what the false prophet has said. Holy Spirit is not here to influence them. Therefore, they will not stop. They will not repent. It's a sad state, isn't it? Verse 16, also it, we're still talking about the false prophet, the false religious system of the day, also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Not everybody gets the same mark. See that? Some people get a name, some people get a number. Who gets which? I don't know. And I really don't care. <laughs> Sorry, I really don't care who gets which one. I feel totally broken over those that do get it because they're lost eternally. But this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. So in other words, the beast will represent himself to the world as a man. And that man's number is 666. And that is what I think is the culmination of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, because we see here the false prophet declared to be a man, we will see, and we have seen already, the political kingdom represented by a single ruler who is a man. And then at the midpoint of the tribulation, we will read about it in the chapters to come, Satan will indwell a man. And we see the three men of the world who represent themselves as God. And when Satan indwells the Antichrist and eliminates the false prophet, declaring that he now is also the false prophet, we see the three in one. Satan's attempt to duplicate the Trinity. And that's what we see happening here and declared that this is the number of a man. This is not, this beast rising up out of the earth is a person who is a spiritual leader recognized by the whole world as being the one final Messiah 
who brings peace and spiritual life to the political kingdoms of the world. Any questions? Okay, uh, chapter 14. We still are in this parenthetical period right here of the dragon, the anti-god, and so on. And we've got a little bit more to look at before a harvest starts. Uh, and so let's look at, verse, or at chapter 14. John looks, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now I'm going to read this all the way over to verse 5 so we get a context and then we'll talk about it. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. <laughs> These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now, the first thing we have to determine is where is this taking place? The, um, there are two views. There's, there, there's obviously two options, and which option you choose determines your viewpoint on who the 144,000 are here. Option number one, uh, promoted by John Walverd uh, and others, uh, promotes that this is a view of the actual Mount Zion in Jerusalem on the earth. That what John is seeing right here is a summary of what's going to take place over the next three and a half years. So what these what these interpreters of Scripture say is that when John looks and on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, this is taking place immediately before the beginning of the thousand year reign of Christ. That what we're having back here at the beginning of chapter 14 is a preview of this event over here. And then chapters 15 through 20 are going to take us back and show us how we got to there. Okay, makes sense. It's a parenthetical, let's look ahead, let's summarize what's about to come, and now let's go back and we'll put all the details to it. And there's much validity to that. So there's the Lamb, Jesus Christ, standing on Mount Zion, who has returned to earth to set up his kingdom, and with him are the 144,000 that, so that this becomes the same 144,000 of Revelation chapter 7. So that here we see in Revelation chapter 7, we saw those 144,000 sealed with the name of Christ on their forehead. A little more description is given here according to this interpretation that they also have the Father's name, not just the Son's name on their forehead, but that's the only difference really, and so they're probably still the same people. And again, I'm just, I'm not saying that 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 I'm telling you that's what to believe. I'm giving you this is just the first option. And so uh, these 144,000 that were declared to be protected by God during the tribulation, they would not be able to be hurt by the Antichrist. They would not be able to be hurt by the false church. And here we are at the end of the tribulation, and Jesus Christ is standing with them and declaring, they made it. They made it. And they're mine. And some say that's what John is seeing. And when he sees it, he hears a voice from heaven. Now the reason that the, the, these interpreters believe that this is taking place on earth is because the voice is heard from heaven. If this was taking place in heaven, then it wouldn't say there was a voice from heaven. It would just say, I heard a voice if he was already in heaven. And so there's where they're getting the distinction that this is probably a, four pic a picture of what might happen at the end of the tribulation. I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And thy voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Imagine that. 
thunder that sounds like harp music. I, I, I can't picture that. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the, the uh, elders. Who was singing? But if the 144,000 are on earth, how are they in heaven singing before the throne? You see, now we run into a little problem. So is it the voice that he heard, the voice from heaven like the roar of waters, the voice was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and listen, here's how to look at this. The voice, singular, was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps who were also singing a new song before the throne. So in other words, the one voice sounds like multiple harpists and multiple choirs. But it's the one voice that is being described. Okay? You gotta read carefully. So that's how this first interpretation would read that. And then it says, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So for some reason, God creates this magnificent song that is available only to the ones who survived the tribulation. 144,000. Man, I'm pretty convinced that as much as I don't want to be a part of that choir, there'd be something pretty awesome about being a part of that choir. That's a bittersweet kind of a thing. You have to go through the tribulation to be in that choir, but the fact that you're in that choir, you get a song of redemption from God himself that you and you alone for all eternity get to sing, and nobody else other than your group can sing it. And then it describes who these people are. They have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Now, let's be careful. Don't take that literally. When we're talking about defiling themselves with women, we're talking on behalf of a false Babylonian system of religion because the very next angel that comes in verse 8 says, uh, or the, uh, the, there's two angels that come, there's actually more than that. There's five that come. But the, the second of the five in verse 8 says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So these 144,000 came through the tribulation, standing with Jesus, and he looks at them and go, and he says, Thank you for not falling prey to the prostitution of true spiritual life with the false religion of Babylon. Okay? So that's not, that's not physical virginity, that's spiritual virginity that they're honored for. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Alright? Uh, this interpretation says that if that was declaring that this is taking place in heaven, then what significance is that? To follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Because the Lamb has always been in heaven. So, what, what does that mean? But, if the Lamb is, is leading them around the earth to different places on the earth, into different trials, into different hardships, and they were willing to follow the Lamb wherever He took them, it makes a little more sense in that interpretation. It also says, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. So, in other words, first fruits, do you remember, you know what that means? In, in the scriptures when it talks about first fruits it tells us that Jesus was raised from the dead as the first fruits of many that will be raised in other words they're the ones who were the the it's, it's a pick of the litter basically the pick of the litter we're told in scripture that we're supposed to bring our first fruits to God as an offering on Sundays when we come to church and bring it into the storehouse of the local church the first fruits. What does that mean? It's the best of the crop. The best of the crop. So here we have Jesus recognizing these are the best of the crop. These 144,000 that went through the whole tribulation. And in their mouth no lie was found and they are blameless. They spoke the truth. They lived the truth. No lie in their mouth. No contradiction in their life. 
They were blameless. And so the possibility is that Jesus is standing with these 144,000 on the earth, and this is a picture of what's, what it's going to look like after all these bowls of wrath are poured out, and Jesus returns to establish his kingdom. Part of the reason that this uh, uh, interpretation feels that way is because uh, there is a, when this happens, Jesus is depicted in verses 14 through 20 of chapter 14. Jesus is depicted along with another angel as holding a big sickle, and they harvest the earth, and they bring the wrath of God down on everybody who's in the earth, and all of the armies of the enemy, verse 20, verse 19 and 20, are harvested in the winepress of the wrath of God, and the blood flows as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's 200 miles. Okay, 200 mile river, five feet deep of blood. Okay, so that's a depiction of this great battle at the end of the tribulation where Jesus comes as all of these armies had gathered to try to overthrow Israel once and for all and all the Jews and that Jesus comes with all the armies of heaven and he destroy, puts his feet down on Mount Zion, destroys them all and begins the millennial reign. That's interpretation number one of chapter 14. Interpretation number two is that this is taking place in heaven. 144,000 are not the same 144,000 of Revelation 7. 144,000 of Revelation 7 are Jews. Here it says that these are, uh, it does not identify them as of the 12 tribes, 12,000 of each tribe. It just says 144,000 who had his name and that they're already in heaven like the martyrs of the tribulation that are under the altar. But they're not declared to be under the altar. They're declared to be with the Lamb, standing on spiritual Mount Zion in heaven. And here's how the rest of those verses are interpreted based on that. Okay? Here's a voice from heaven. Not, uh, and, and all those things are the same. But the, the, those that are singing are these 144,000 and they're singing this song before the throne of God because that's where they are in the presence of Jesus Christ. And who would they be? The question is, who would this 144,000 be? Tim LaHaye says this. And based on what Tim LaHaye says, you will get an idea of how the deception has come across the, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses to believe that they are the 144,000, or some of them are. Some of you have always had a question, maybe, when you think about the Jehovah's Witnesses who declare that they are the 144,000, and that they're out there knocking on doors and working hard because they want to be qualified to be one of the 144,000. And then back, I remember back 20 or 25 years ago, it was declared that the the list by the rulers of the Jehovah's Witness Church, the list had been complete and all 144,000 were in place. And so all of them that are out there working today, I don't know what they're working for. But, but that was just, I, it, but where did that teaching come from that people had the right to earn the right to become members of the 144,000? Well, it comes from this interpretation. Not that Tim LaHaye is the founder of, don't, please, no, Tim, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. You're not, but they've distorted what you believe to take it to believe what they believe. Tim LaHaye says this, the 144,000, the key is to understanding them that they are the first fruits. In other words, they are the pick of the litter. From the entire church age since the resurrection of Jesus Christ until the beginning of the tribulation, Jesus is keeping track, whether it's a literal 144,000 exact people or whether it's a symbolic number of the perfection of all of his people, because that's what 
the 144,000 of the Jews means 12,000 from 12 tribes. The perfection of the nation of Israel is represented by the number 144,000. Whether it's a literal number or not, it doesn't matter. He said, I'm going to perfect the nation of Israel. So what represents the perfection of the church? All of those who have accomplished these things, who did not defile themselves with women. In other words, they were spiritual virgins. You were never tempted and you never fell to false teaching. You never wavered, you never wandered. Since the beginning of the church age until the rapture of the church, Jesus is keeping track. How many Christians really fulfill all of these things? And I can set them up in heaven as the epitome, the first fruits of why I died. The first fruits of why I died. And if you're thinking right now, well, that's not fair. Why isn't it? Why isn't it? You know, if, if you assign, if you, if you had two children, and you assigned both children a job, and you said at the end of the job, if I'm satisfied with how you did it, I'll give you a dollar. One comes, did the job perfectly, you give them a dollar, the other one comes and didn't do the job perfectly, and you say, go back and keep doing it until you get it right, and then maybe I'll give you a dollar, but because you didn't get it right the first time, I probably won't give you the dollar, but I'll thank you for getting the job done and anyway when you get it done, and I'll say, you did a good job, but you just don't get the reward that somebody who did the job perfectly gets. It's totally rational, isn't it? Totally rational. You do that in your performance reviews at your employer all the time. Whether you're the employer or you're the employee, that happens all the time. How did you do with your job this year? Did you fulfill all the obligations of your job description? Did you do it all well? Did you meet the standards that were set before you and the goals and the objectives that were set before you? Did you do all the things that we asked you to do with the spirit that we asked you to do them with? Great, here's your reward. You get a bonus plus you get a raise for next year. Or, no, sorry, you're, we're gonna, you'll, you'll still have a job, but we need you to do better. Totally rational and totally fair. Why can't Jesus do the same thing with his church? He's chosen a symbolic number of those that represent the perfection of why he died. Those who never spiritually faltered and said, you know, I'm going to try that belief added to this for a little while and see if it makes faith better. It's those who have followed the lamb wherever he went. Told you to go as a missionary to... Uh, to uh, Papua New Guinea, you know, come on, retired farmer, and you want me to go overseas and go to Papua New Guinea and live and serve, and they did. Will you go wherever the land tells you to go? These people did. They've been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb because in their mouth no lie was ever found and there was no contradiction in how they lived their life. They lived it faithfully as servants of Jesus Christ. And just think, because the rapture hasn't occurred yet, that 144,000 isn't complete. Maybe one of them is in this room. Now don't think, oh, it's too late. I already blew it. Doesn't matter. We don't know what God is going to use as his final criteria of grace for selecting this group of people who will stand before the throne of God and sing a song that only they get to sing and none of the rest of us get to learn. That's the interpretation of Tim LaHaye and maybe others. But it was in his book that I read today, so that's why I share that because it was it's a different way of looking at it from the traditional way of looking at this, that this is taking place on the earth and it's a vision of what's gonna be happening at the end of the tribulation and now we're gonna go back and we're gonna put details to it. And so I offer that to you just because it, it motivates me to live a life today that even if I've already blown it, if life started today until the rapture, would I be qualified? And would you? Any questions? Okay. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead. Now, if the events of verses 1 through 5 are happening in heaven, 
What? What's overhead. What's overhead. <laughs> exactly. So possibly John is still visualizing things from the earth perspective. I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, okay, get it, here we go. Here's the eternal gospel. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the springs of living water, of the springs of water. Wait a minute. This is the last chance According as you read the rest of the as you read the rest of the history of the, the tribulation period, this is the last chance that the people of the earth are going to have to hear the gospel. It's the last chance. The two witnesses are gone. The hundred and forty four thousand are being pursued by Satan. And they're in their place of safety in the second half of the tribulation now in the, in the confines of wherever God is protecting them. So they're not out there witnessing and sharing the gospel anymore. There is nobody on the earth who is sharing the gospel right now. The beast has been given power to kill anybody and everybody who declares the gospel. So if somebody is brave enough out there to say, I know what the truth is about Jesus Christ, they're killed. There's no evangelism going on. And so God sends an angel to do it. And he's going to hover over the earth, directly overhead of John, means he's directly overhead of everybody. And he declares the gospel, and this is what he says. Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Nothing about Jesus. There's nothing about the cross. <clears throat> Why? Why? Why is this the eternal gospel? Good question, huh? I suppose you want an answer. <laughs> been thinking about it all day so <laughs> yeah why is that phrase the eternal gospel well number one just to be fair there are many places in scripture where it says the gospel this is the gospel and they say different things okay can we condense just because it says that he has been given the eternal gospel to proclaim to all those who dwell on the earth <laughs> and just because the first thing that John hears him say, does that mean it's the only thing he's going to say? No. So if we're going to presume that, then we're, we're, we're wrong. Because the gospel is declared as being, there, there's many facets to the gospel. And that's why it takes a pastor, like me, so far, 38 years of preaching, and I still haven't told you everything. Okay? <laughs> Because the whole counsel of God is the gospel. But it's interesting where this angel chooses to start in the declaration of, God, of the gospel. I think that's the significance here. Is that as he is given this message of the gospel to give to the world, what's his starting point? Fear God. And give him glory. What's been happening on the earth? Who have they been fearing? The Antichrist. the Antichrist. Who have they been giving their worship to? The Antichrist. Who are the people of our world around us giving glory to? I, I have no idea who they're giving glory to. You know, they're giving glory to their jobs. They're giving glory to their employer. They're giving glory to their pocketbooks, to their retirement funds. They're giving glory to their house, to their boat, to their camper, to their possessions. They're giving glory to the power that they've established for themselves. They're giving, them, they're giving power to their educational abilities. They're giving power to all kinds of stuff, or giving praise and glory to it, rather. They're giving glory to all that stuff. They're worshiping it as the means of having value in life. And the starting point is, wait a minute, what's your God? Who's your God? That's a starting point for evangelism with anybody. Anybody that you meet on the street. It's the best question you can ever ask anybody for their, uh, 
for the, the opening line of witnessing to them. Who's your God? Or what's your God? Have you thought about that? What do you think a God is? What's a God supposed to do? And we have here at the end of the age a declaration of the foundational principles of who God is. Give him glory and worship him for two reasons. Number one, he's the one who judges everything. You don't get to judge it for yourself. But I made myself worthy. No, you're not the judge of that. Only God is the judge. So, because he is the judge and because he is the creator. This whole creation debate that's going on in, in America today over whether or not creation is valid and we have only a six or 6,500 year old world or do we have a 65 billion year old world? This whole debate. Beginning of the Bible starts with what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How do we have the end of the tribulation coming? The angel declaring the eternal gospel to the world. God made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. He made it. It's his. He designed it. He created it. There was nothing circumstantial or nothing big bangish about it. It was created by God the way God said he did it. And we need to, if we're going to talk to people about who God is, we need to present him in the right way. Now, having, yes? So it's just something came to mind as we were kind of, that starts off with fear of God, and it made me think of in Matthew 22, 37, as the, they're asking him, what is the greatest commandment? And he said to them, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Yeah. So look to the right God. Love always involves a little bit of fear. Listen, if, if, if you raised kids, you know this to be true. And if you're going to raise kids, you will find it out to be true. That uh, in love, if your kids don't fear you, then they don't really love you and understand your love for them. There needs to be a fear. Um, my wife uses this on the grandkids all the time. <laughs> she says, if I would have said something like that to my grandpa, I would have run to my bedroom in fear of what was coming to me. <clears throat> and yet you ask her, did my grandpa love me? Yes, absolutely he did. You see, we've, we've gotten away from this concept of fearing. Can, can any of us even begin to imagine? Can we even begin to imagine whether or not God is um, powerful enough to just, with a blink of an eyelash, wipe us from the face of the earth? Is, is he not, doesn't Hebrews tell us that we are to fear the one who holds our eternity by a string? I, I think we, it, it's great that we understand that God is love, but the perfection of God means that he's also greatly to be feared. Greatly to be feared. And we've undermined what that word means and the eternal gospel that this angel proclaims is fear God. Understand, try to understand who he is and the more you do, the more you're going to just be in such awe of him that you're afraid of what it might really mean. You fear him. And then worship him because he's the creator. He is so big and so powerful and so awesome. That's the eternal gospel. And as a result of that, the rest of the gospel will be proclaimed as well, I would imagine. The rest of the Bible proclaims the rest of the gospel of God initiating contact with what was lost and seeking it so that it could be saved. Verse 8, another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. 
I see this again as an indication at the end of the tribulation. I, I like I, I personally see chapter 14 as happening on earth, not in heaven. I personally see it as as the just kind of the overview of, okay, we're ready to start the second half of the book now. Let me give you a summary of what's going to take place, and then we're going to put the details to it. And so uh, here's the angel declaring Babylon the Great is going to fall. In the mind of God and in the mind of all those who are in heaven, it's already fallen. In the mind of God today, Babylon has already fallen. In the mind of today, in the mind of God, the rapture has already taken place. In the mind of God, everything is the present. Okay? Again, challenge your brain to think about this. There is no past and there is no future in the, in the presence of God. Everything is the present. That's what eternity means. There's no time. We have no time. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to go a couple more minutes. But... Uh, uh, the angel declares Babylon has fallen. What are we talking about? We could be talking about the, the Roman Empire, which is uh, most, uh, most interpreters of prophecy believe that Babylon is depicted by the revived Roman Empire and that they're one and the same. It could be that Babylon represents the spiritual kingdom and the revived Roman Empire will connect with the false religions uh, under the false prophet and the false prophet carrying mystery Babylon, this woman of, of false doctrine uh, and will join up with the government and so it could, have, it could be that that Babylon has fallen, the beast has fallen. But most likely what this means is that the actual city of Babylon has fallen. Because later on we will read about the spiritual kingdom coming to an end. But I think here at the midpoint of the tribulation the actual city begins to fall. Now, whether that's actual Babylon in Iraq, where Babylon exists, uh, ancient Babylon is in the modern-day country of Iraq, whether, uh, whether, I, wait, or is it Iran? Iraq. Yeah. It's Iraq. That's what I thought. Okay, yeah, the, the seven, one of the seven wonders, the gardens of, are in Iraq. That's right. Thank you. I all of a sudden had a brain lapse. Um, now I got another one. Where was I? <laughs> or whether whether Babylon now here is represented by wherever the capital of this new Roman revived Roman Empire is that the dragon has revived. Uh, that that the capital city is being shaken, and that's what's going to drive the Antichrist into Jerusalem to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem in the temple because the city of Babylon, the capital of this, of this empire has fallen. It's not clear. But I think this is, this is to be interpreted um, literally that it's the city of Babylon representing the, the, the city that is the, the capital city of this revived kingdom that is making all the nations drink the wine of her passion of sexual immorality, her false lifestyle of spiritual life, and this city is going to be destroyed. And then a third angel comes with a loud voice saying, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength, into the cup of his anger. Does God get angry? Yeah, he's even got a cup that he fills up with wrath so that he can express it. And he will be torn, look, look at, and he, the one who follows this false system, the one who follows the Antichrist, the one who rejects the true Savior, Jesus Christ, will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here we have a declaration of all of those in the tribulation who reject Christ and who choose the Antichrist instead. This is their eternal destiny. And what is it? It is the literal fire of hell. But look at the description. Okay? There are several very descriptive things in this that are important. First of all, they're all smokers. <laughs> Sorry. 
the smoke of their torment goes up momentarily and then they're annihilated. So annihilation, uh, uh, annihilationism, the view, uh, the view that some Christians today claim that in the end, all sin and all sinners will just be annihilated. Do you know what the word annihilated means? What does it mean? Obliterated. Obliterated. Gone. Cease to exist. Is that, is that a physical possibility in our created world? No. Nope. It's not. There is nothing that is of physical matter, nothing of physical matter that can be annihilated. It can be forced to change its existence, its shape. You can blow up a city and you can call it annihilated, but it's not. Every element that made up that city is still in existence. You cannot annihilate anything that God created. You can't. And so the people who believe that in the end everything will be annihilated are denying a physical reality. Okay? They're denying scripture. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Now, while they're suffering, number one, they're suffering with fire and sulfur. Fire and sulfur. <coughs> um, look up on, just do a Google search on burning sulfur sometime and see what it does. Okay, what? Rotten eggs. It smells like rotten eggs. Yeah, sulfur does. But uh, you should read how it burns. But the fire is not the only torment. The fact that they're burning in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Imagine this. Everybody has said, heaven's out there, hell's down there. Here's how I see it. Hell is just a different dimension, a di different dimension that coexists with heaven. And we're not capable of seeing the other dimension, but they are. And in the presence of the holy angels, with full visibility, remember Jesus and Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man in the fires of hell, and the rich man is looking up and he sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. Does it ever tell us that Lazarus sees him? No. See, two different dimensions. And hell exists in the presence of God because when all of everything is destroyed and God creates a new heaven and new earth, God being omnipresent is present everywhere anyway, isn't he? Can he not be present in hell? And the fact that he remains distinct from it and not influenced by it but allows everybody that's in it to see him and to see the Lamb, and to see the holy angels, and to see all of us, imagine the torment of that while you're burning. And then on, add on top of that that they never get to sleep. No rest, day or night. Hell is a real thing, and it's horrible. And it is stated here this way because John says, here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Endure. Persevere. It's going to get tougher out there, folks. It's going to keep getting tougher and tougher for Christians. And then verse 13, we'll close with this. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So John says at this moment, when Babylon falls, the Antichrist begins to move toward Jerusalem. The angels have come. All of those that are, that are following the Antichrist are being declared, they're, 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 this is your end. And then he says, but all of those who are still alive in the tribulation, no matter what it leads to, right to the very death, the beheading of your body, 
in death. However gruesome the, the killing of the, of the Christians by the Antichrist is going to be, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. And the spirit, the real spirit of God says, blessed indeed, that they may rest from their labor, labors for their deeds follow them. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, I beseech you that you understand that your labor is not in vain in the Lord at any time. So it says, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Right here, in Revelation 14, 13, same thing. Your labor for God follows you. It is not in vain. Be immovable, be steadfast, be strong. Keep serving him, no matter what the persecution. And even if they try to kill you, blessed are all those who die in the Lord from this point forward. Amen. God bless you.